Okay, so we're going to talk about geologic time today. And of course what we are talking about is important. You need to know what you believe and you need to know why so you don't have problems in the future when you see all this science and you wonder is it right or does it cast some doubt on what the Bible says and so forth. I want you to learn that science does not really have anything that can refute the Bible. All right. And the closer and closer you look at evolutionary mechanisms and evolutionary ideas, they sound good on the surface, but the more you look into them, you'll see how faulty they are and how the unsubstantiated they are. Okay? So that's one of the other purpose of this class. You need to know what you believe and you need to know that the Bible is very well substantiated by science, not the other way around. So geologic time. Before we get into this, I want to, um, this by the way is the lava domes in California. This is a lava tube, okay? Often what happens when you have a, a plume of lava coming up, the outside of the rock cools while the inside is still molten and it leaves these so-called lava tubes. So a lot of very interesting geological features of the earth, but they don't prove evolution. All right, let's go back and review the two views of geology. We have two opposing views. We have uh, catastrophism and uniformitarianism. You need to know these and be able to contrast them. All right, what is the proper view of geology? Well, evolutionary geology is basically uniformitarianism. And catastrophism, of course, goes with creationism. Catastrophism is where we're going to bring the Genesis flood into our explanation of Earth history. Catastrophism is the belief that the geological features of the Earth are better explained by catastrophic events, in particular the Genesis Flood. What is uniformitarianism? Uniformitarianism is also a belief that natural laws and processes have always occurred at the same rate to shape the geological features of the Earth. Okay? Same processes acting at the same rates. Those are the two key parts of that, uh, of that belief. Same processes, same rates. And remember I told you on Thursday that uniformitarianism is not the same as the principle of uniformity, although evolutionary geologists would say it, it is uniformity. Well, there's nothing wrong with the principle of uniformity. We know that God finished creation on day six, rested on day seven, and he put laws and natural processes into motion, and they are stable. Otherwise, we couldn't study science. So we don't have a problem with uniformity. Uniformity, we can see that natural laws and processes occur at constant rates or very measurable rates, and we can study them, but we don't extend that into the past. That's uniformitarianism, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, the two key points of catastrophism, which I didn't ask, here's the first one. Natural processes are insufficient to explain the Grand Canyon, was our illustration. So, with catastrophism, we say that these natural processes acting over eons of time are insufficient to explain observable geologic features of the earth. Whereas uniformitarianism applies uniformity to the past. So they use present processes to reconstruct the past. What's the famous quote that summarizes the view of uniformitarianism? The present is the key to the past. We also said another way that we can um, summarize uniformitarianism is what? Processes over geologic time. All right, then we also said that catastrophism is a better model to explain the Grand Canyon or any other features because it predicts 
All right, um, we kind of had to hurry through the end of the lecture on Thursday, but I told you that Henry Morris presented a very good way to argue against evolution and argue for creationism or for catastrophism, and that is the prediction versus accommodation argument that he set forth in his book, Scientific Creationism. It happened in the past. It's historical science. So we're in the same, we have the same problem that evolutionists do. We can't prove creation and we can't prove the flood, but we can show which model predicts the geological features of the earth best. So what does catastrophism predict versus the uniformitarian model has to accommodate. They had, remember the story of how the Grand Canyon formed and the problems with using uniformitarian principles to explain it. How did the Colorado Plateau become uplifted an average of 9,000 feet? How did that happen? What happened because of the flood? It did happen. How did it happen without deformity? If it happened gradually, those rocks would be deformed just like they are when you have the uplifting of mountains and so forth. So remember, the catastrophic model of Earth history, still Earth history, so it's still historical science, but it has more in its prediction column and less in its accommodation column by far than uniformitarianism. The best way to argue with historical science is prediction versus accommodation. All right, many of the Earth's present feature to include the Grand Canyon is more easily explained and would be even predicted by a global catastrophic flood and all the runoff from it, correct? And what's in the fossil record, mass fossil graveyards, that's predicted by a catastrophic geological model. It is, has to be accommodated by a uniformitarian model. And of course we have large areas of sediment, we have the uh, movement of the continents, and so on. So can you compare and contrast the uniformitarian model of geologic history versus the catastrophic model of geologic history? Okay. Remember what is found in the fossil record. Fossil graveyards, large amounts of animals and plants buried together at the same time. Is that going to be gradual death and gradual covering in sediment? Well, no, and that doesn't work very well for fossilization anyways. So the uniformitarian model, just like the evolutionary model, has to accommodate rather than predict. All right, so today we're going to deal with what's called geochronology dating of rocks, dating of the earth, and so forth. All right, let's begin with the biblical age of the earth. The biblical age of the earth um, in the 1600s was calculated by the Archbishop James Usher. And what he did is he calculated backwards from Bible genealogies. He came up with the 4004 BC date for creation. All right, so then if creation occurred about 4,000 years BC. That means then we have 2,000 years after Christ. That puts the age of the earth in the 6,000 range. So there is 6,000 years of biblical history. That gives us a good reference point for how old is the earth. So if we want to put it in round terms, the earth is less than 10,000 years old more likely closer to 6,000 years old using the biblical record of history, which is how history is done, looking for records. So we have 6,000 years of biblical history. That means the earth is about 6,000 years old, certainly less than 10,000 years old. We want to put it in rounder terms. And that's um, James Usher in the 1600s. Evolutionary age of the Earth, around 4.6 billion years old, and there's the three reasons we're going to 
ultimately the three ultimate reasons that the earth is that old. The first is the evolutionary paradigm. Evolution needs a lot of time, doesn't it? The second reason is uniformitarianism. And the third reason at the end, the newcomer to the argument for an ancient, ancient, ancient earth is radiometric dating. Radiometric dating is a very, relatively young science, isn't it? Did they use radiometric dating to decide that the earth was billions of years old? No. What did they actually use? The first one. What's the first basis of this ancient billion year old earth? The evolutionary paradigm. The need for a long earth history for the earth to evolve, for life to evolve, ultimately for humans to evolve. Okay, so the main reason we have a billion year old, billions of years in our earth history is the evolutionary paradigm, the need for it. And then uniformitarianism, and then last and actually least is radiometric dating. So I'm gonna talk about how this was derived and show you a little bit of history of how it was derived and show you that science has not proven the Earth's age is 4.6 billion years old. Early attempts to date the Earth. We have some early attempts to date the Earth. The first one, French, calculated the Earth to be about 75,000 years old, <clears throat> going off the idea of how long it took a ball of iron to cool and extrapolating back mathematically. 75,000 years, okay? Then you see the man in the middle. Who is James Hutton? He's the originator of what belief? Yes. Yes, and how did he give the age of the Earth? Solely based on the evolutionary paradigm. The Earth is immeasurably old. He didn't put a date on it. And this, of course, was due to the need. He started, he's, he's one of the first ones to originate uniformitarian ideas. And he was one of the first to start consistently referring to the Earth as being millions rather than thousands of years old. Prior to that, the Earth was viewed biblically as being thousands of years old, not millions and certainly not billions of years old. Lord Kelvin measured cooling rates. Lord Kelvin had the idea that the Earth had to be the same temperature of the sun. And so he calculated how long it would take for the Earth to cool from about the temperature of the sun to its present temperatures. And that's where he got, he got a quite a wide range, 40 million to some 400 million years. Um, that, of course, that idea was abandoned because the Earth is molten rock and iron and so forth, and the sun is gas. So it doesn't really apply. But here we are starting to date, the, trying to come up with methods to put a number on the age of the Earth. So then how was this 4.6 billion years derived? <clears throat> the numbers do come from radiometric dating. The idea of billion years does not. Do you understand that? The number 4.6 billion years does come from radiometric dating but not the idea of billions of years that's actually behind it. Of course, we have the discovery of radioactivity in 1896. Okay, and then Ernest Rutherford. He was one of the first to start measuring the decay of radioactive isotopes and trying to apply that to the dating of rocks and minerals. That would be Ernest Rutherford and others. I just picked some of the major um, persons involved here. What is a radioisotope? Okay, you ready for some chemistry? It's after eight, we can handle a little chemistry. All right, elements exist in various forms. Let's take a simple element like carbon. How many have ever heard of carbon-14? That's an isotope of carbon. Most forms of the element carbon are carbon-12. Carbon is element number six. That's its atomic number. That means it has six protons in its nucleus. Well, carbon-12 has six protons in its nucleus, 
and then the rest of its nucleus contains neutrons, right? So how do we get carbon-12? Six protons plus six neutrons give its approximate atomic mass, called atomic number. So carbon-12 is the element carbon, and it has six protons, that makes it carbon, six neutrons, that makes it carbon-12. Atomic mass number is 12, okay? Or atomic weight, is it sometimes called. There's also carbon-13. It still has the six protons, but then how many neutrons does it have? Its atomic number has to stay six, or it's not carbon. So if it's carbon-13, what is the makeup of that? And it's called an isotope. What is the makeup of that isotope of carbon, carbon-13? What would it be? Six protons and seven what? Neutrons. Neutrons. That's carbon-13. Carbon-14 is another isotope of carbon. And of course, to be carbon, it has to have six protons, and then carbon-14 would have how many neutrons? Eight. Carbon-14 is a radioisotope. A radioisotope is an isotope that will spontaneously decay into another isotope. So it's said to be radioactive. That's what I mean when you see the term radioisotope. It's a different form of an element that is unstable and will decay. And as it decays, it gives off radiation, so it's called a radioisotope. So Ernest Rutherford was one of the first to start calculating, started calculating radioactive decay. So here's where we're going to proceed to and be, begin using radiometric dating. Then we have Claire Patterson, 1956. She published a paper using meteorites, dating meteorites. And of course, if you believe in the evolutionary paradigm, you would think that, okay, the solar system and the Earth have to be very close in age because the Earth formed when the solar system formed. So the idea with dating meteorites was that once the, whatever, a meteor is what you see as it goes through the atmosphere, and then once it strikes the ground, it's called a meteorite. So the idea was let's, let's um, date meteorites instead of earth rocks because these earth rocks haven't been weathered or rearranged on the surface of the earth. The meteorite should be, they considered them to be pristine, so they should give a more accurate measurement. That was Claire Patterson, and so she dated the solar system at 4.57 billion years. And then between, they also dated moon rocks. And so then they established the date of moon rocks as being about 4.53 and meteors at 4.57. So the Earth has got to be somewhere in between. So the date there at the bottom is her estimate. Claire Patterson estimated in the 1950s that the Earth would be about 4.55 plus or minus, that's her margin of error, according to her calculations, billion years old. So the age of the Earth is actually an estimate, okay? So what is that 4.6 billion years? Sometimes it'll be 4.5, it'll be right in that range. What is, the, what is the 4.6 billion years that we've been talking about? It is an estimate based on radiometric dating of moon rocks, meteorites, and the oldest rocks they can possibly find. They're always looking for older rocks, even though there has never been an earth rock dated this old, at least at this point of time. So what is that 4.6 billion years? It is an estimate. That sounds like a quiz question, doesn't it? It's an estimate based on, we put the age of the Earth, based on the idea that the solar system has got to be about all the same age. So we're making an estimate based on moon rock dating, radiometric dating, meteorite metric dating, even though we've never actually found rocks on the Earth that are radiometrically dated as old as 4.6. We're getting close, finding more rocks that are getting closer and closer to that. 
All right, so there's uh, one of the meteorites that was discovered in Greenland in 1894. It's called the Cape York meteorite, and that one has been dated at 4.5 billion years old using what's called uranium lead. So geologic time. Dealing with geologic time, there are numerous methods, and basically we can divide geologic time into two types. What's called relative geologic time, relative time, and absolute geologic time. Absolute, that sounds pretty, pretty well established, doesn't it? The difference between rel relative date time, the difference between relative geologic time and absolute geologic time is how, what the answers are given. Relative time places events and formations in sequence. So when we're dealing with relative time, we're dealing with order. This happened first, or this was laid down first, then this. So relative time does not give dates. Relative time merely puts things in order, relative one to the other, okay? Relative time in age would be that I am older than you. Okay, that's a relative time. If I want to do absolute ages, I would have to give you how old I am compared to how old you are in numbers. That would be absolute date. So what's the difference between relative time and absolute time? Relative time is only a comparison that puts formations or rock layers or events in order. Absolute time, on the other hand, assigns specific ages to events or formations. That's the difference. Not the idea that absolute has been absolutely established, but the fact that it assigns a number. Relative time does not assign number, it just puts it in order of what is older on the bottom versus younger on the top if we're dealing with rock layers. That's relative time. Absolute time is where we're gonna assign a specific number. So 4.6 billion years is a, an example of absolute geologic time, okay? If I were to say then that the um, Earth is older than the moon, that is relative time. See the difference? Relative time versus absolute time. All right, relative time is based on rock positions, on the position of the layer, <clears throat> or whatever geologic feature or formation we're dealing with, based on the position in the layers. Bottom layers are older. The higher we go up our rock layers, the younger the rock. That's relative time. It's based on position. Absolute time can be based on correlation or radiometric dating. And a lot of it is more tends to correlation. Radiometric dating is a very difficult chemical analysis that involves sophisticated uh, methods, expensive equipment, et cetera. So it isn't used as much as they would have you think it is. All right, <clears throat> relative time uses six principles. And this is how they date things. So we are gonna go through the six principles. Um, absolute time often applies the same principles, but it's called absolute time because it's going to assign a date. So the difference between relative geologic time and absolute geologic time is not that one is scientific and one is not, not that one is relative and one is absolute. It's in the, how the information is expressed. Relative time, only places them in order, younger versus older, older on the bottom, younger and younger as we go up. And then absolute time is gonna actually assign a number, assign an age or assign a date. Even though a lot of the absolute dates are based on the same principles as the relative dating. And what are those principles all point to? And all those principles, principles pretty much are a part of the evolutionary paradigm. All right, six principles of relative dating. Here is the reality of how most dates 
are derived. <clears throat> Even though these are relative principles, they are often applied in the absolute category. But here they are. Here's the first. Original horizontality. And that simply means that rocks are deposited in horizontal layers. And then the deformed layers that are not horizontal would have had to have been deformed after deposition. Do we agree with that principle? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but it is an assumption. We don't have a problem with that principle. And it is observable. The next is lateral continuity. So we have original horizontality and lateral continuity. Sediment forms in continuous lateral layers. That's the principle. And then layers separated by an erosion feature were once continuous. Here's where we start taking more assumptive liberty is on the second part of this. On the second part of this, lateral continuity principle, um, the layers separated by an erosion feature were once continuous. That's where we're starting to take more and more liberty with our assumptions. The third one is cross-cutting relationships. Any geologic feature that crosses over or cuts through other layers of rock must be younger. And this goes along with the original horizon horizontality principle. The layers are laid down horizontal, so if we have something cutting through, it's going to have to cut through after the layers were already deposited. That's a, called cross-cutting relationships. Any geologic feature that crosses other layers of rock must be numbered younger because before the, those layers have to be laid down before they could be cut through. That one doesn't, that makes sense, and there's nothing wrong with that principle either. That's a geologic principle. Kind of that's the problem with studying geology. You have to wade through all this evolutionary parts as well and think, okay, is that true or is that not true? So those are the first three, original horizon, horizontality, lateral continuity, and cross-cutting. Okay? And a lot of those, especially the, the first and the third, make a lot of sense. The lateral continuity gets stretched towards the end. The next principle, and this is the most important one, so this is the one I want you to pay attention to. This is the main principle that is used for both kinds of dating. So I, I said we've got relative geologic time and absolute geologic time. And the difference between the two is not in how they're derived. You need to understand that. The difference between relative geologic time and absolute geologic time is not in how they're derived. It's in how they're expressed. Relative time puts things in order. This is older, this is younger. And what is that? That's the law of superposition or the principle of superposition. But this is also used with so-called absolute dates. And this is how index fossils work. Okay, superposition. So this is the most important dating principle and it applies, well they may not say so, but it applies to both relative geologic time and absolute geologic time. The difference between the two is not in how they're calculated or derived, it's in how they're expressed. Relative just says older, younger, puts things in order. Absolute is the one that assigns dates. That's important for you to keep that straight in your mind. Otherwise, when you look at geologic dating, you go, it goes all in circles, okay? And it gets confusing because the law of superposition, as it's frequently called, is often applied to absolute dating as well. The difference between relative time and absolute time is that absolute time assigns a number, relative does not. You've got to understand that. All right, so the law of superposition is the most important principle of geologic time and deriving geologic time. And this is the idea that sediment is deposited in upward stacking layers. 
Sure, that's not a problem. Okay, and then in undisturbed succession of rock, the oldest layers are at the bottom. That's not a problem either. What is the problem with the law of superposition for us as creationists, as young earth creationists? The problem is uniformitarianism. The problem goes back to catastrophism or uniformitarianism. We believe, I believe, that those layers were laid down very or relatively rapidly, as we will talk about Mount St. Helens and how, just how rapid sediment can be laid down. So the problem with the law of superposition is not the fact that sediment is laid horizontally upward and not the fact that the bottom layer was deposited first. The problem with it is the interpretation of it being interpreted in light of gradual millions of years of sedimentation. That's the problem. Not the problem with geology. It's not a problem. Geology is not a problem. The problem is the interpretation. Do we interpret it in light of the evolutionary paradigm using uniformitarianism, or do we interpret it in light of creationism using catastrophism? The evidence is all the same. The rock layers are the same. Okay, we don't deny the existence of the rock layers. We deny the interpretation of them, and we deny the time that is put on them. Okay, so the law of superposition is the most important, and we don't have a problem with the law itself. What do we have a problem with? How it's interpreted and how it's applied. Okay, another law is the law of inclusion. And this says that fragments are younger than the rocks that enclose them. Okay, because they had to form first before they were incorporated. I said that backwards. It should be included fragments are what? Older than the rock that forms around them. See how confusing it gets? Relative time. And all of this is historical science, isn't it? So we have to make assumptions and so forth. So then the included fragments are older. And here's the second most important principle. I want you to make sure you write down and understand those two. The law of superposition and faunal succession. Because both of those two ideas are used to derive absolute dates as well as relative dates. The law of faunal succession, what is that? Look at what it means. It means that life forms evolved in a recognizable order. Okay, and then groups of fossils precede one another in a regular and determinable manner. What is that? That's evolution. So the problem with this, ty this type of dating is this last principle. All of our dating, whether it's relative or absolute, boils down to our presupposition, our evolutionary paradigm. Faunal succession, the principle of faunal succession is basically evolution. What do we base our order on? The recognizable order. Recognizable how? Recognizable how? By evolutionary beliefs. And that groups of fossils, they're called fossil assemblages. Fossils assemblages that they will precede one another in order. That's relative dating, but it's also applied in absolute dating. Absolute dating, these are the two main methods. And I keep telling you that absolute dating uses some of the same principles that relative dating does, and this is where it comes in play, except for when it's absolute dating, we call it correlation. Correlation dates rock layers by the fossils they contain. It's called correlation. 
So this is another way to express the final succession principle that we just talked about and superposition. So it's correlation that's going to combine the law of superposition with the law of final succession and relate the two together. We're going to relate the fossils to the rock layer. That's what correlation refers to. We're going to relate the rock layer to the fossils it contains. Well, that's fine because obviously the rock layer has to be associated with the fossils it contains. But the problem is the interpretation is based on faunal succession, which is evolutionary progression. So correlation is basically the faunal succession principle. We will relate the rock layers to the fossils they contain, but how do we date those fossils? By faunal succession. So correlation is where we date rock layers by the fossils contained. Is this how rock layers are primarily dated? The answer is yes. We don't use radiometric dating on rock layers. Hardly ever, if ever, we use radiometric dating on rock samples. Radiometric dating is expensive and difficult. So correlation is probably the main way most rock layers have been dated given absolute dates. And this is where we see a rock layer, we look at the fossils they contain, and we look for an index fossil. An index fossil is a distinctive fossil. It's been identified that it's widely distributed, so we see it a lot, but it lived a brief time and has a common extinction. So if you were to bring or show an uh, evolutionary geologist a layer of rock and ask them how old it is, they would not chip off a sample and radiometrically date it. They would look for an index fossil, they'd find an index fossil, they'd open up a book, and they'd look it up to see when it evolved, and then they would date the rock layer at that age. Even though they will deny that. You probably were taught, if you went to Christian school, you are probably taught that it's circular reasoning. Date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the... And it, it is. Maybe that's a little oversimplified, but it's correct. And it's called correlation. Though they would never admit to it. The real way that they date rocks and rock layers most frequently is through correlation using the index fossils. They look to see what fossils are in the rock layer. They find an index fossil, which is a defined particular fossil, they look it up, and they say, okay, this, a lot of them are trilobites, this trilobite evolved, um, let's say, 550 million years ago, okay, and then it became extinct um, 525 million years ago. They're just looking it up. And so the rock has to be between 550 and 525 or whatever. Do you understand that? That's called correlation, and that's literally how most things are dated. Yes? So who dated? I mean, who dated? Who? It's, it, that, it's called the geologic time scale, and it's been updated and refined over probably mm, 75 years. And so it's a big compendium that they would have, and they'd have to continually buy a new one that was updated. Okay, and then some of that has been radiometrically dated. I'm not saying it hasn't. But the actual practical day-to-day -day way that they date is index fossils. It's called correlation. So it is true that they date the fossil, the rocks by the fossils they contain. But how do they date the fossils? Faunal succession, evolution. This evolved here, so the rock is that old. And what is it? It's all evolutionary assumption. Now, radioactive decay is the basis of radiometric dating. Okay, radioactive de decay, we're going to spend a whole lecture on this. But it has the idea of measuring decay between two different types of isotopes. The first type of isotope you can see there is radioisotopes. Those are unstable radioactive 
elements that will decay. And they're going to decay through this relatively complex procedure. They're going to be given off radiation, and then they will eventually decay to a stable form. The stable form at the end of the, radiation, the radioactive decay series is called the radiogenic isotope. So there's two kinds of isotopes. Radioisotopes, those are the unstable isotopes that will decay through a series of decay steps to a stable isotope and the radiation, the radioactive decay stops. The stable isotope is called radiogenic. That means it came from radioactive decay. So radioisotopes are also called parent isotopes. Those are the ones that will decay spontaneously through a series of decay reactions. And the daughter isotope is actually called a radiogenic isotope. That's the stable isotope that results after a radioisotope has decayed. And we can measure these. And this is the basis of radioactive decay is the basis of radiometric dating. All right, and then we're going to pick different isotopes and different techniques. How do they pick it? What does it say? How do they pick which dating method, which isotope to use? Well, it does depend on what they're dating, the rocks that they're dating. But even more important, what does it depend on? The expected evolutionary time frame. Okay, here's three radiometric dating techniques that we will talk about in more detail. Go ahead and write them down here so that you can have seen them twice. That'll help you to learn and remember and understand it. We have uranium lead. That is the most common. And this is the method that was used to date a lot of the meteorites in the 1950s to try to establish that 4.6 billion year absolute date for the Earth. Uranium lead, <clears throat> notice U is the um, symbol for the element uranium. And notice it's mass number 238. Then PB is the um, symbol for the element lead. And then you can see what there's a series of decay steps until the stable radiogenic isotope is lead 206. So the radioisotope is uranium 238. The radiogenic isotope is lead 206. Radiogenic is the lead. Radioisotope is the uranium. Uranium is the radioisotope. It's unstable. It will decay to lead. That is the radiogenic isotope, the stable. Okay, so the radioisotope U238 will decay through a complex series of um, subatomic particle emissions, alpha, beta, which depends on which subatomic particle is being emitted, until it reaches the radiogenic isotope lead. This has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. A half-life is the time it takes for half the sample to decay. We'll come back to half-life later. So why do you think they picked uranium lead to date meteors, meteorites? Look at the half-life. And plus there was a lot of uranium content. Potassium to argon is probably the most, the second most common. Potassium is not P, its elemental symbol is K. So that's potassium 40 will decay. That's the radioisotope. It also goes through a complex series of subatomic particle emissions to the radioisotope, argon, uh, radiogenic isotope argon. See the terminology and the notation. AR is the um, symbol for the element argon. 40 is its mass number. That has a half-life of 1.3 billion years, so we're not going to use that on meteorites. Then radiocarbon dating is in its own category, and we will talk about it separate from radiometric dating, but it does involve radioactive decay. 
The radioisotope is carbon-14. Notice it decays to its radiogenic isotope, nitrogen. Okay, so we've lost a proton, haven't we? Okay, so three main radiometric dating techniques. Radiocarbon dating is used to date organic material. That means something that was once alive. Now we can't date fossils with it because fossils have lith lithophied. Mm. They've become stone, but we can date amber. We can date wood that may have been trapped somewhere. We can date remains that are not fossilized, once living materials. Half-life is only 5,730 years. All right, then the geometric, geologic time scale. This was derived, here we start with it in its earlier forms, and then we get to the more expanded form over the years, and here's what it looks like. Oh, wait a second. I'll show you what it looks like now. To answer your question, Kelly, it's been updated, refined over 50 plus years. All right, so then here it is, and it was developed using evolutionary ideas. This geologic time scale, um, there's some main, there's basically two sections of the geologic time scale life, and then the um, when the Earth evolved, when Earth evolved, and then when life evolved. So in this geologic time scale, you can see there's going to be two important things I want you to notice. The explosion of life, it's called the Cambrium explosion, where all of a sudden in the fossil record we have all these invertebrates. This is about 570 million years, that's a date I want you to know. Then what's the bottom picture? Dinosaur extinction about 65 million years ago. So those are some two important boundaries and dates on the geologic time scale. So there are three eras of geologic time that you need to know. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Because all those things are going to be put in context of these three main eras. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Paleozoic is the oldest. Paleozoic. You see the word zo in there? The root word is the same as zoology. So paleo, meaning ancient. Paleozoic literally means the age of ancient animal life. The dominant species is invertebrates. And then, of course, the appearance of fish. Notice the date. For the invertebrates, or the Cambrium explosion, about 570 million years ago. The age of ancient animal life, zo, referring to animals. The middle is the age of medieval animal life. This is the age of the dinosaur. And then look at the, another boundary with the meteorite. Here it is, 65 million years ago. You see that? And then the Cenozoic age literally means the age of recent animal life, and this is the emergence of the mammal. Apparently some small mammals survived the meteorite impact, and you can see that is 65 million years ago, and so forth. So that's what the geologic time looks like now. Two last thing. What's the best kept secret of evolutionary biology? It was on the test. Fossil record. The fossil record does not support evolution. What's the best kept secret of evolutionary geology? They don't use radiometric dating. What do they use? See here on the bottom? What they actually use is faunal succession and index fossils. So. The best kept secret of evolutionary biology is that the fossil record doesn't have transitional forms. It doesn't show the succession it should. And then the best, the best kept secret of geology is they don't use radiometric dating. What did they use? See it there? 
faunal, succession, and index fossils. Okay? We'll have to talk more about the geologic column on Thursday.